Good morning. My name is Zi Ding, General Chair of ICAS 2016. We thank you for staying till the last day, and we thank all the plenary speakers for putting up such an impressive and outstanding plenary series. On March 22nd, the world and ICAST 2016 were shocked and horrified by the cowardly attack on the innocent people of Belgium perpetrated by the cowardly terrorists. We mourn the losses of those innocent lives and our condolences to the families for their losses. Our hearts are with the people of Belgium and all the people whose lives were seriously impacted, affected by this cowardly act. Unfortunately, because of the terrorist attack, our plenary speaker for today, Professor Johan Suiken, was unable to make it to the conference. We are very fortunate and we are thankful, however, that Professor Suikens was unharmed, even though he was on way, en route to the airport. But he's safe, he's unharmed, and we are very thankful. The organization committee would very much like to thank Professor Johan Suikens for his dedication and his effort. In the past two days, the OC members and Professor Suikens worked diligently to put together a video presentation of his plenary talk. During the next hour, we're going to hear the, uh, Professor Suikens talk through pre-recorded video. At the end of the video, we'll facilitate the question and answer period. Now, allow me to introduce our technical program chair, Dominic K.C. Ho, who will introduce today's speaker, Professor Johan Soikens. Thank you. Thank you, Professor C. Dink. Uh, so thank you for coming to the last section of the uh, Pinui talk. So although Professor uh, Johann Sukens is not here, we would still like to uh, introduce him to you. Uh, Professor Johann Sukens, he's actually from uh, KU Leuvent University. Uh, he's actually well known in uh, machine learning, cellular neural networks, and also nonlinear modeling. He has uh, written uh, three books in this subject and also edited another three. Um, he actually also received many awards, including the uh, IEEE Single Processing Society Best Paper Award, and also the uh, International Neural Network Society Young Investigator Award. And uh, he's a fellow of IEEE for his contribution on these squares support vector machine. So uh, as uh, Professor Seating mentioned, Professor Sukens is unable to join us today, unfortunately due to the uh, bombing attacks. Uh, but he is uh, very kind, so we work for the last few days to uh, put up this uh, going to be a very entertaining and rich in technical content video, and I hope you will enjoy it. And this video is actually going to be dedicated to the uh, victims and their family members. Uh, so at the end, uh, we are going to have a uh, tele uh, conference with uh, Dr. Uh, Sukens, and he's going to answer any questions you may have. So without further ado, I think we should uh, start the uh, video, and I hope you will enjoy it. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome in this uh, presentation about learning with primal and dual model representations, a unifying picture 
Uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference. It's really a great honor to, to speak for this audience at the IPCASP conference. In fact, I'm also very happy to uh, still be alive because earlier this week, you have probably heard about the terrorist attacks uh, in Brussels. If I would have taken an earlier flight, uh, I could have been dead because I would be right at the time of the attacks uh, in the departure hall, which is completely uh, destroyed for the moment. So therefore, I would like to dedicate this talk to all victims of war and terrorism. And I propose that we have uh, one minute of silence now. Let us continue with the presentation. So we are living in a, in a data and signals world. So in, in more and more applications these days, uh, lots of uh, data points uh, are, are available. Think, for example, about uh, predicting energy consumption, traffic networks, communication networks, uh, also in, uh, in medical applications with new technologies, data are generated in sometimes in very high dimensional input spaces, also towards brain machine intelligence. And in many of these applications, one is becoming uh, critically depending, uh, in fact, on uh, high quality uh, predictions. Here you see one application that we are uh, studying in, in our research group, which is about uh, black box weather forecasting. So you see that these days, black box techniques have become in fact so powerful, uh, thanks to regularization mechanisms, uh, sparsity, kernels, support vector machines. So there are a lot of progress has been made and in some applications, you can even become competitive with uh, physical modeling approaches. So here we, we, in fact, start from several measurements, high dimensional regressor vectors uh, at several measurement locations and uh, do this in a black box way. And in fact, we are currently competitive with uh, predictions uh, from uh, Wonderground at this point. So this is very encouraging uh, towards the future. Generally speaking, there are in fact uh, very many challenges now, new challenges uh, in the context of data-driven modeling. Um, so in fact, in a lot of application fields, you see very specific methods, uh, well-developed methods, but often very much focused towards specific application fields. It's in fact also very challenging trying to come up with some general methodologies, generically applicable methodologies that are applicable for a very wide range of, uh, of applications, uh, both for high dimensions and large data sets. So also in the era of big data, scalability is also very important at this point. And in some applications, we also hit the boundaries of some mathematical framework. So towards the future, there is also probably a, ne a need to rethink even our uh, mathematical foundations that we are using uh, towards future developments. So here you see an outline uh, of the talk. Um, we, we will start with uh, aspects of sparsity, both in the context of parametric and kernel-based uh, modeling. And then we move more towards uh, learning with models that you can characterize with primal and dual representations. Uh, we will discuss some theoretical aspects there related to supervised and unsupervised learning, but we will also be going towards applications like networks uh, and big data. Towards the end of the presentation, uh, we will show some recent work, uh, recently published work with a new variational principle for the singular value decomposition, which you can also conceive within a, a similar setting. And to conclude the presentation, I will also propose uh, a new unifying theory, uh, common foundations uh, for uh, both deep learning and uh, kernel machines. 
So if we look at influencing methods over the last uh, decade or decades, I think uh, there has been a lot of progress in general, uh, for example, with respect to sparsity and compressed sensing. In, on a different tech, also support vector machines and kernel methods. An aspect which is shared by, by both of these uh, directions is also convex optimization. It's also surprising to see how many problems can be formulated as a convex optimization problem. So you may wonder towards the future, maybe there are some new synergies proper, uh, possible there. Uh, and some new developments in between uh, these different directions. So in this talk, we will uh, explain how a primal and a dual uh, setting could uh, contribute uh, towards such an understanding. So we start now with uh, explaining what we mean by sparsity, uh, both in the context of sparse linear modeling and kernel-based uh, methods. So, in fact, the sparsity mechanisms are fundamentally different. If you have a linear parametric model and you want to estimate a parameter vector w, well, then you typically use something like lasso, an L1 regularization uh, scheme where your solution vector w will be sparse. On the other hand, if you use a kernel-based uh, technique or support vector machines, then the sparsity will be at a different level. So if you take, for example, the epsilon insensitive loss function that you see here, uh, the region which you have around the origin, there the loss function is zero, and that leads you to a representation which is uh, sparse in that case. If you look at uh, sparsity, it is also possible in a lot of applications to go from models which are characterized by vectors towards matrices or, or even tensors. So in that case, you have uh, matrices for the data or tensors for the data, but also the model itself is characterized by a matrix or a tensor. And you're making use then of an appropriate inner product, uh, for example, of the Hilbert-Schmidt type. And in this case, the notion of L1 regularization rather becomes the nuclear norm regularization where you take the, the sum of the singular values that you are minimizing, so you could look for a low rank uh, solution. And towards tensors, this could possibly be related to higher order singular value decomposition, where this is then related to several matrix unfoldings. But the notion of rank in the context of tensors, it's uh, much more involved than in the matrix case. So therefore, you can also go much beyond problems as matrix or tensor completion. So currently, it's also possible to learn tensors either in an unsupervised or in a supervised learning setting, also work with robust loss functions and things like that. If we see at uh, kernel-based learning techniques, then one uh, important direction there, a common way of s describing such uh, methods is by function estimation in reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So then it's well known that for whatever convex loss function you are taking, that the function f can be represented in the way that you see here, as a sum of kernel functions evaluated at these data points and multiplied with these alphas. So in the context of kernel-based learning and also support vector machines, uh, often you work with positive definite kernel functions then. And in many applications, a simple choice is to work with linear polynomial or Gaussian radial basis function kernel. If you use these kernels and you tune them, for example, by, by tenfold cross-validation, often in 95% of all the applications, you may already have very good results. But in fact, it's also possible to develop kernel functions which are tailored towards the specific application fields. You may have, for example, a graphical model, a Bayesian network from which you're extracting a kernel function, and then you plug it in or in your support vector machine, or graph-based kernels, tensorial kernels, wavelets, string kernels in text mining, and many others. So for the rest of the presentation, we will 
take a somewhat different approach. So we will rather focus on characterizing models in a different way by means of primal and dual model representations. And this is very closely related to all the work of uh, support vector machines. So to start with, to explain it in and introduce it in a, in a rather simple way to give you the right feeling for the problem, consider this problem of supervised learning. You have given input data xi and target data yi. We have a predictive model which is parameterized by parameter vector w. So you could use something simple, like uh, you minimize the sum of the squares of the errors, and, and like in a rich regression scheme, you could also minimize the parameter values themselves. So you could, in fact, solve this in your W vector and analyze the properties of the estimator and things like that, and you could say, okay, what else could we say about it? End of the story. So, but what you could also do in this case is to rewrite the problem as a constraint optimization problem. So what you do here is you introduce new variables, the error variables, EI, and you write it as a constraint optimization problem. You could say, why should we do that? You could plug in the E's in the objective function and solve for the W. Well, the reason, in fact, is that in this way you can create an alternative representation for your model. A representation in the Lagrangian multipliers, alpha i, which are related to these constraints. So you have as many Lagrangian multipliers as the number of training data in this case. For example, when you use basis functions phi j here, and you take a linear combination of basis functions and you stack these basis functions in a so-called feature map, as you do in support vector machine methods, then it is possible to write it in terms of your kernel function, which is in fact the inner product of the feature map applied to this pair of data points. And this methodology is in fact possible for a very wide uh, range of problems in, in supervised and unsupervised learning especially for the, the case of so-called least square support vector machines. For this class of methods, you work with equality constraints and with the L2 loss function. So you have then typically linear systems or eigenvalue problems or generalized eigenvalue problems to be solved at the dual level. So in fact, you could even see this as a kind of optimization approach towards basic problems in, in linear algebra. So this is just a partial list. You can do many more things here, for example, towards data visualization, recurrent networks. Uh, this is just a, a fraction of the whole list. Here you see another example in, in recent work. I've also been showing towards physics that it is possible to obtain at uh, the dual level the probability rule in the, in the quantum measurement postulate. So in a similar way, uh, in physics, you have least action principles from which you can derive an equation of motion. So here, the primal problem uh, is also the starting point, and from there, you derive then this uh, probability rule. So in this case, you just have the simplest example of a pure state. It can be extended also towards mixed states, even open quantum systems, POVMs, and things like that and you have a set of measurement uh, operators. It's also striking that there is a close similarity between this formulation and uh, what is known as uh, Parson estimators, for example, in, uh, in non-parametric statistics. So here in this paper, it's also shown that there is really a striking similarity between all these uh, formulations with a complete primal dual characterization of the problem. So sometimes people also ask, yeah, what is the difference between uh, neural networks and support vector machines? Uh, do they have something in common? So often I say then uh, support vector machines, they are in fact more neural networks than the original neural networks because in fact you have a neural network interpretation both in the primal and in the dual. Uh, because in, in the primal, the number of hidden units equals then the dimension of the feature space. 
uh, while in the, at the door level here, it will equal the number of support uh, vectors that you have. So it's in fact this Mercer kernel, this kernel trick, which is serving then as a bridge between the primal and the dual. So also in the field of statistics, you have on the one hand parametric methods, on the other hand, you have non-parametric techniques. There is also semi-parametrics in between, but these are quite separated uh, subfields, I would say, while in this case, you have one model, and in the primal, you have, in fact, a parametric uh, characterization of the model, while the dual is kernel-based and is much closer to, to non-parametric statistics. So, inherently, in the, all the kind of formulations that we will see from now on, you have these uh, double representations, and this makes it also very powerful uh, as, uh, as a mo modeling uh, framework. So to fix the IDs, just consider, for example, the case of a, of a linear model that you see here, linear parametric model with a parameter vector W that is unknown, bias term B. If you look at the dual representation, it is expressed then in terms of the Lagrange multipliers alpha i. But what you see is that the amount of unknowns in the primal and in the dual, it's different. In the primal, the W is of the same dimension as the input space, while here in the dual, the alpha vector has the same dimensionality as the number of training data. So that means, in fact, that you can start tailoring the representations towards the given nature of your problem. Let's say you have a large-scale data mining problem uh, with millions of data points in a relatively low dimensional space, then it's not very smart to solve this in the dual because you would have a huge kernel matrix, while if you solve it in the primal, you have uh, the solution immediately. And when you have a linear model, you have this possibility. Uh, both uh, approaches are possible. On the other hand, if we have few data in a very high dimensional space, then it's the opposite. Then you better sh solve it in the dual, like when you have microarray data sets or text mining problems. So for linear models, you have the choice. On the other hand, when you go to nonlinear models, if you work, for example, with the Gaussian RBF kernel, then it's well known that the feature map is infinite dimensional. So in that case, you can only solve the dual problem. So you can only have both choices provided that the feature map is finite dimensional and that you also have the explicit expression of the feature map. Also note that here, as a notation, we use the transpose notation, which is in fact implying that everything is finite dimensional, but this can also be extended to the infinite dimensional case. And for example, uh, in this work by Michael Fanuel of our uh, research group, we have been, in fact, relating the feature map to uh, coherent states, which is uh, well known in mathematical physics and also towards wavelets. So what you see here is bracket notation. And you can start then, in fact, from a formulation in a Hilbert space. And it is possible to explicitly transform the formulation from the Hilbert space to the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So a special case of this is, in fact, a wavelet transform. We call it the HHK transform, where H stands for Hilbert space and HK for the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And if uh, the eta, the coherent states, relate to wavelets, then it's, in fact, corresponding to the wavelet transform. So this gives new insights towards uh, developing more advanced kernel functions, but also, for example, for learning on graphs. Uh, we have also been uh, using this in this context uh, with graph wavelets. And this is, for example, also related to work of uh, van der Gens in the field of uh, signal processing. So in this case, you can also work with the formulations in infinite dimensional spaces. Another extension is, for example, towards indefinite kernels. Uh, a limitation often of the classical support vector machine formulations or 
if you work with reproducing kernels, is that the kernel function should be positive definite. So here in this setting, you can work with the difference of two positive definite kernels. This got, that can give you an indefinite kernel. And here you see for the LSSVM case, so in the LSSVM classifier and regression case, and if you also take the LSSVM setting for kernel PCA, then it is straightforward to modify the formulation as you see here. So you can arrive at the same dual problem, but then plug in a much uh, larger class of kernel functions, including also indefinite kernels. So this is also related to uh, work on reproducing kernel CRAN spaces, uh, of which you see here also some additional references. Some other most recent work that we have been doing is uh, on learning in Banach spaces with uh, very new generalizations now to support factor regression. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Saverio Sal uh, Salzo. So you see here also the link to the archive paper, uh, which uh, is accessible since uh, Monday this week. So it's uh, very, very recent work. So we have here generalizations of support vector machines in the sense that you can also take different regularization schemes. In the usual uh, support vector machines, if you work in the full setting, kernel-based setting, then it's limited to the two norm on the W vector. So what we want to do here is we want to approximate with this regularization term an L1 regularization scheme. So you see that here in this LR space, R is equal to M divided by M minus one. You see when M is large, then R is in fact approaching the value one, then it's approaching an L1 regularization. If M is equal to two, well then you have the usual uh, L2 regularization. So what is nice in this case is it's, it's all based on convex analysis uh, by means of fan shell rockefeller duality. We are able to show for this generalized support factor regression that there exists a tensor kernel representation at the dual level, which you can see as a full generalization of the usual kernel trick. So you have the usual kernel trick for M equal to two. But if you take, for example, M equal to four, then you have a fourth order tensor instead of a second order tensor. So in this case, uh, the larger M, the larger the order of the tensor. And we can also have here a continuous representer theorem. So it's uh, uh, yeah, a combination, let's say, of L1 regularization, or you try to approach L1 regularization uh, combined with uh, general convex loss functions, including epsilon insensitive loss function or, or uh, L2 loss functions. So this is also related to work in uh, reproducing kernel Banach spaces. So this was about uh, more theoretical uh, aspects of, of the work. Uh, you could wonder, yeah, what can it mean in practice for you? If you have a practical uh, problem in uh, networks or big data, what has a primal dual setting to offer here? So a technique which was already proposed in our uh, book on, on LSSVM is a so-called fixed size technique. So suppose you have a data set of about one million data points. Uh, what you could do is take a subset, uh, let's say 1,000 data points, and instead of considering the kernel matrix on the huge uh, data set, you could consider it on, on the smaller data set, apply the Nistrom approximation, in this way obtain an approximation to the feature map, which is finite dimensional. You also have the explicit expression then, but you can use it then in the primal and solve it in a parametric way. And the nice thing is that you get a sparsity for free there in such a case. And you have them several techniques for, for doing uh, the subset selection. So here we have compared such techniques with uh, the standard support vector machines. Everybody who tried support vector machines in practice on real life data, you know that if you tune them well, often you have a lot of support factors. So if you see here in the last column, you have uh, more than half a million data points, but you see that you have more than 180,000 support factors for the standard SVM. While with the fixed size technique, it's only about 500 and you have the same performance 
in this case. You also have something like new tube SVM formulation by Shulkov and colleagues, where you can control the amount of support factors, but if you reduce the amount of support factors, then your performance will be degrading. So it is really very challenging to de develop techniques which are at the same time highly sparse and which can also give you a very high performance. So we have some uh, developments in our research uh, team to have uh, sparse representations and new kinds of support factor machines where you can steer uh, the distribution of the support factors. This is so-called discrepancy type of SVMs which are uh, very promising uh, towards the future uh, in that respect. So up till now we have been uh, focusing a lot on supervised learning problems. Now we are going to explain more about uh, unsupervised learning with kernel PCA and related methods of uh, spectral clustering. So well known is the kernel PCA method as proposed originally by Shulkov and colleagues where you take the kernel matrix, you do an eigenvalue decomposition on that and you can do nice things with that for dimensionality reduction or denoising. But what you see here is that you have also a primal dual characterization to it. So the eigenvalue problem is in fact only corresponding to the training problem. While here you also have a model-based setting where you can evaluate a model then at uh, new data points and do out of sample extensions. You also see that the underlying loss function here is the L2 loss function. So that means that you can also uh, explore other loss functions like a robust loss function to have, for example, uh, a robust version of the kernel PCA. That is something that you see here. You see an image that is corrupted by noise, but it's not just Gaussian noise, it's, it's noise uh, from a, another noise distribution with heavy tails, and on top of it there are strong outliers. So you see that the kernel PCA fails in this case, while this uh, more robust version gives you then uh, quite nice uh, reconstruction results. Also towards kernel spectral clustering, you can have this primal dual characterization. So this is in fact then a weighted version of the kernel PCA where V here in red is a weighting matrix which relates to the inverse of the degree matrix of the graph. So in that case, the dual problem relates in fact to random walks algorithm uh, as is well known in uh, spectral clustering problems. So in this way, thanks to this kernel based uh, formulations, you can do a lot more. You can do out of sample extensions, you can start def uh, defining training validation test sets, do model selection, work with representative subgraphs and try to exploit this to uh, uh, very large uh, problem sizes uh, to many data points. So here you see a, a simple uh, toy problem related to, to clustering where this is used for model selection. You have here the results with a Gaussian kernel for two different choices of the bandwidth. So in spectral clustering it's well known that you have this nice piecewise constant properties of your solution vectors but that is only at the training level. So here we have the kernel based representation and we try to achieve the same properties at the validation level, so at the generalization level, in fact. So you see that in that case, to have the good results, you need this clean line structure that you see here. So that serves then as a model selection criterion at the validation level. And you see that it's quite important to do this selection very carefully. Here you see the result on uh, image segmentation problem. It's also possible to do this uh, for hierarchical uh, clustering where you look then over several scales. You work multi-scale and you look for uh, bandwidth uh, scales of your kernel function where the clustering results are stable. Stable in the sense of having a good generalization. So everything is driven by trying to achieve good generalization, also in this case of clustering and unsupervised learning. And you also see here in these plots, yeah, the nice out of sample extensions, you can evaluate the model 
in the whole input space. So this is also relevant towards graphs. And you could wonder what is the notion of a data point in a, if you have a graph. So in this case, you could define a data point, the i data point as the i column of your adjacency matrix in this case. And in similar ways as with these fixed size techniques, uh, but, but using a, another type of criterion of interest, you can then extract a representative subgraph uh, for a possibly very large uh, scale network that is, that is given. So we have been also extending this to uh, big data networks. So in this case, you can even work on a laptop scale to address problems like you see here, going to four million nodes and more than 30 million edges. So we have been tackling this problems just on a laptop scale. You work with the representative subgraph and you complete the rest of your network at the test level for the complete graph, which has in this case more than uh, four million uh, nodes. So this has also been benchmarked uh, on uh, lots of examples of the, the SNAP uh, database at Stanford where uh, many network data are available in comparison to other methods. So we see that with this approach you typically uh, find uh, better solutions in terms of conductance or in terms of number of clusters. But also towards uh, multi-level hierarchical uh, clustering and this is already going a bit in the direction of deep learning, where you extract, in fact, several sets of features over several layers. So here you have several levels, and at each of these levels you have, in fact, kernel matrices. It's an agglomerative form of clustering. And you look, in this case, over several scales of the network. And what is surprising here is that this method is really able to have stable and, and very accurate uh, high quality results for the clustering on uh, all different levels from fine to coarse uh, levels and several intermediate levels while with many of the state-of-the-art techniques you can uh, have only good results for few, much fewer scales in fact than, than with this technique uh, that, that we have here. So all of this can even be tackled on a laptop scale. So the next step is then to go to, to big data uh, beyond uh, the laptop scale, of course. So here we have been proposing uh, additional techniques based on uh, KNN uh, graphs. So it's already known in sparse linear modeling, for example, in the work of Agarwal, uh, that you can go to Terra scales if you have linear models with sparse learning. On the other hand, if you work with kernel methods, it's really challenging because you have these huge kernel matrices. And so in this case, we have additional schemes to work with uh, KNN graphs to uh, work then also in a MapReduce setting. And then in the reduce step, merge the results from the KNN subgraphs that were loaded per node for slices of the kernel matrices. So this was work uh, which was presented at the IEEE Big Data uh, Conference and where uh, also thanks to the Julia language, uh, there are some new developments there to scaling to uh, very large problem sizes, even big data. So our next application is towards online learning, incremental learning. Here you see an application of clustering time series related to pollution. Um, I will show a little video about it. So what you see here are the countries Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands and you have here several measurement locations and what you here see are in fact the different time series and the clustering is online. So you see it's detecting here a, a, a new cluster. And in this setting we are in fact making use of out of sample extensions uh, uh, because we can also develop a notion of out of sample eigenvector. The notion of eigenvector 
is in fact at the training level, but because we have the primal dual setting, we can uh, also uh, make out of sample extensions and do the updates in uh, an efficient way. So we are also in an optimization setting, so that means that if you have additional prior knowledge, for example, you may want to characterize this by additional sets of constraints or smarter regularization schemes. So often we will work with LSSVM core models. The reason is that it's often interesting to have a core model which is not too complicated. Now you may also use uh, the standard support vector machines here, but then for your basic model, it may be that you already have a lot of inequality constraints, and if you have a lot of additional constraints on top of it, it's often not so convenient. So in an optimization setting, you have then the optimal model representation from the conditions for optimality, and also the optimal model estimate. So here you see uh, an example of uh, imposing constraints. We have here an image which is basically consisting of three clusters, the sky, the ground, and the horses. But you see that there is also the shadow of the horse here. So it's in fact completely arbitrary whether the shadow will belong to the horse or to the ground. So you have to explain the, the thing, the context, and what you could do here is pick, for example, these two pixels and say they should belong to the same cluster, while here a pixel on the ground and a pixel in the sky, you can tell they should belong to different clusters. So in this way, you see if you put this as additional constraint information at the dual level, it gives you a smarter kernel function, and you see that you can significantly improve the, the clustering performance in this case. So what is also possible is to uh, work with such unsupervised models as core models and use it for semi-supervised learning. So you, in learning theory, there is a lot known about uh, semi-supervised learning, manifold learning, like in the work of Belkin, but often you start there from a core model which is supervised. So here in this case, you can have such a KSC model, clustering model as the core model, and you give them the additional knowledge uh, through the regularization term. So here on top, you see the results from the kernel spectral clustering, uh, which is already uh, quite good, but you can make the model smarter if you just give a few additional hints, and in this way, your performance uh, is, uh, is further improved. So then we come to the, to the last part of this presentation, which is about uh, a new variational principle for the singular value decomposition. Uh, in fact, it is conceived within the LSSVM uh, setting, and uh, the work has been published last week in uh, the journal Applied and Computational Harmonic Analysis. You see here the singular value decomposition of a matrix A. So in the general case, the matrix A, it's a non-square matrix. And that matrix A is decomposed in this way. You have orthonormal matrices U and V and sigma is a diagonal matrix. So the singular value decomposition, it's one of the major workhorses, I would say, within the field of signal processing since the early days. And you could wonder, yeah, is there still something new about this? Because it's, it's already known for uh, such a long time. So what we do now is, in fact, as a starting point, is given the non-square matrix A, we are going to extract two data sources from this matrix. So we are going to scan the matrix column-wise, and then also row-wise, and in this way you obtain two data sources. But the matrix is non-square, so the dimensionality of the vectors for the rows and the columns will be different. So if you would like to compare them through correlation, for example, it's not immediately possible because they are not compatible in dimension. So therefore, here we introduce a notion of compatible feature maps. We have two feature maps, phi and psi, 
and you see they bring the original dimensionality to the same dimensionality n. That's what we mean by compatible. So the psi map is just the identity map, while the phi map, in this case, is the multiplication of the original data with the matrix C, which is unknown at this level. It's called the compatibility matrix, and its role is to bring the data uh, X to the same dimensionality as the Z data. So what is possible then is to come up with a new primal problem formulation. It's in fact a new variational principle. And you start here from the data xi, you have the score variables ei, here you start from zi, you go to the r variables, it's in an LSSVM setting, so the L2 loss function is used here to minimize the e's, you have equality constraints, and the first term here is an overlap, so you check in fact the, how the w and v are related with respect to each other. So if you conceive this uh, at the dual level, because the alphas and the betas that you see here are the Lagrange multipliers related to this set of constraints, well then you get this matrix here. It is possible then, and it's shown in this paper, that if you take this choice, ACA is equal to A, if you find a matrix C that is satisfying that, then it's possible to relate this problem to the Lanchos decomposition theorem. So it's a paper by Lanchos from the 50s. It seems to be forgotten, but we need it here to make the connection between this dual problem and uh, the, the primal formulation that you see here. So it turns out if C is the pseudo inverse of A, that this is one way to, to achieve this. Um, so then this matrix here becomes A, and the other block becomes A transpose. So what is also important to notice here is in this setting you can also go beyond the Mercer theorem. So if you have, for example, a square matrix, a symmetric matrix, then in fact the data sources X and Z will be the same. And then the W and the V, they will be reduced to the same thing, and also the E's and the R's. So in that case, the primal problem is the same, as the primal problem for the kernel PCA. And then you have the original kernel trick because the phi and the psi would be the same. So then it would reduce to the old uh, kernel trick with the Mercer kernel. But here you go beyond uh, yeah, the, 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 the Mercer theorem, in fact. So in the paper, it's also described how you, in this way, can achieve a nonlinear SVD and there are no restrictions anymore on the kernel function. You can specify a kernel function which is operating on the compatible feature maps. And for the case of a linear kernel, it just corresponds to the, yeah, the SVD as we know it. But you can also plug in all kinds of kernel functions, not limited to being positive definite. So here you see examples of combinations of linear and polynomial exponential kernels and the columns that you see here indicate 20 and 100 components for your um, singular value decomposition in this case for the kernel case. So you also have the primal formulation here. This might also be promising towards developing robust versions like we have seen that it's possible in the kernel PCA setting and also towards tensors, for example, when you have a tensor object you might follow a similar methodology uh, to reach a full uh, decomposition at the dual level. So also towards tensors, I feel this can be promising towards the future. A lot of things could be developed there. So now we come to the very last uh, part of this uh, presentation. Here I will make a proposal for uh, a new theory of uh, deep learning uh, with kernel machines. So it's a preprint version of this work is uh, available since last week on, on my homepage. It can be downloaded from there. So it's, it's uh, the most recent work uh, that uh, I've been doing at this point. So if you look at the current literature, it's uh, impressive to see this uh, 
very nice revival of the, the field of uh, neural networks with impressive performance like in applications like computer vision and, and speech um, and, and, and other applications. So this is also possible because in some of these neural networks these days you sometimes uh, train more than a million interconnection weights but the data sizes are also increasingly large so in that sense it has become feasible the computing power is there but on the other hand there are also still the the same persistent theoretical problems as you had them like 20 years ago in the field of, of neural networks while if we look at the field of support vector machines and kernel methods it is uh, related there also to foundations of learning theory and optimization so you may wonder yeah maybe for the future it might be possible to find new synergies or maybe even uh, common foundations and that is what I will try to propose now. There are many other developments uh, by other research groups uh, at this level. Uh, so what I will be proposing is, is one direction trying to possibly achieve this. So there are also different uh, techniques within uh, deep learning, uh, the kind of methods related to what I propose uh, now are in fact uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and their deep learning extensions like belief networks, deep belief networks, and also it is somehow related to the Boltzmann machines. But these methods are typically in a probabilistic setting. So this uh, new setting now, it's non-probabilistic. Uh, the basic models are based on so-called restricted kernel machine uh, representations and they relate them to restricted Boltzmann machines. So here a new kind of duality principle is used. Uh, it's making use of a simple property of a quadratic form and in this way by means of a new duality principle which is called conjugate feature duality you have uh, in fact an interpretation also of visible and hidden units that you also have in uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and the deep extensions. It's also possible to have neural network interpretations uh, in this setting because uh, in uh, old work we have also been treating neural networks within SVM setting by explicitly defining the hidden layer to become the feature map. So it's also possible even to, to train classical multilayer perceptrons or something within an SVM setting. That's something that we already shown uh, very long ago. So this is possible now for kernel machines like uh, LSSVM, uh, kernel PCA, SVD, person type of models. And they relate to the work of restricted Boltzmann machines. The word restricted here refers to the fact that there are no hidden to hidden connections. If you look here at the energy expression, you see here the cross term between the visible units and uh, the hidden units, but there is no quadratic term in the, in the H. And it's also in a probabilistic setting. While on the other hand, in the restricted kernel machines, the, yeah, you have a non-probabilistic setting to start with, and for simplicity, let us take the simplest case of LSSVM regression just for a linear feature map. So in that case, in the primal, uh, if you eliminate the E's and you put the B term equal to zero, then it is also related to rich regression. And here you have the multi-clause or multi-output regression case with formulations that you can also find in our, our book on LSSVM. So this is the starting point. It is possible then to focus here on the blue part by exploiting a property of a quadratic form. You introduce here new features, H, which are conjugated to the original variables, E. And you apply the property here of a quadratic form. So this serves as a lower bound of the original uh, expression. If you then focus here on the red part, it's in fact this red part which can be related to the energy expression as you have it in a restricted Boltzmann machine. 
So, but here we have it in a non-probabilistic setting, so it is not the same, it's not equivalent, but it is sharing some, uh, some things in, in common, uh, conceptually speaking. So this part relates then to the visible uh, units, in fact, in, in that kind of neural network interpretation. So it is based on this property of a quadratic form, and you can easily prove this property based on the, the sure complement form, but it also relates, in fact, to the property of uh, legendre fenchel duality when you would uh, apply that to, to a quadratic function, for example. Uh, for example, the Legendre transform, it's also well known uh, in physics, for example, when you have a Lagrangian formulation in classical mechanics, you can go to a Hamiltonian formulation by considering the, the momentum being conjugated uh, in, in the formulation. So also here then, these hidden features, H, they play a similar kind of role. They are conjugated to the original variables. So that is, in fact, enabling then that you have an interpretation, a neural network interpretation with visible and hidden units, uh, similar like in the restricted Boltzmann machine. So in this way, you have yeah, a new interpretation of your original kernel machine formulation. So when we take this particular interpretation, we'll, we'll be calling this a restricted kernel machine representation. So you end up with a dual solution within this new notion of duality by taking the stationary points here of this lower bound uh, expression, and here you see then your solution expressed in terms of these hidden features H. And so this is in fact replacing the role of the Lagrangian multipliers as you have them in the dual representation, typically in, uh, in support vector machine type of, of formulations. So you have then your original feasible units. You go here with the feature map to a kind of hidden layer. You have the visible uh, E, and here you consider then a so-called inner pairing with conjugate features H, which you can possibly use then later on to create a deep architecture. So the hidden features that you have here, they are taken as inputs for a next layer. So here in this work, we have been giving the example of a deep restricted kernel machine where in the first level you use here an LSSVM classification or regression part, and then the two next layers, they are kernel PCA uh, layers, in fact. Um, so in this case, your objective function is the sum of the objective function for the first level, second level, and the third level. So also for the kernel PCA or SVD, similar kind of restricted kernel machine interpretations exist. And for each of these levels, you have then these inner pairing interpretations with uh, the conjugate uh, duality that I was describing. So in this way, it is uh, possible also uh, to achieve improved results. Here you see some results for a digit recognition on the US Postal uh, database where you have then 10 classes. So here we compare a shallow, a basic LSSVM architecture with a deep architecture, a deep restricted kernel machine where you have an LSSVM plus two kernel PCA levels where the kernel PCA levels here are linear. So in that case, you also get a kernel fusion interpretation, in fact, of your, your deep uh, RKM. So you see then at each of these levels, you are in fact fusing the information uh, of your original variables and also the hidden features of, of, the, of the, the several uh, layers. So it's very revealing in terms of its uh, interpretation. So you see here pictured uh, the network, the interconnection matrices that you have and the top layer here is the last kernel PCA uh, layer, and you have here different choices for the number of components that you take. 
And you see in this case that the additional layers, they are really doing something. And because here, all the tuning parameters were selected based on a validation level. And you see then in this kernel fusion interpretation that the deepest layers, that they get the highest weight. And you get the highest uh, performance, the best improvement of the deep architecture when they become the most active. So it's not that your solution is a minor modification to the, to the basic LSSVM. It's really, uh, yeah, the additional layers, they are really uh, important here to, to get uh, the improved results. So of course, more uh, benchmarking and, uh, and testing might be needed at this point, but it already looks uh, rather promising. So it is time now to uh, conclude this presentation. I've tried to, to show uh, that it's uh, possible to find some new synergies at the level of parametric and kernel-based modeling, but also in the context of deep learning, uh, kernel-based modeling and neural networks. For many of the, the things that I have been discussing today, it is possible to take primal and dual uh, model representations so we have seen that you can also go beyond the classical kernel trick and we could work also in like in CRAN spaces, even in infinite dimensional Banach spaces, get finite dimensional representations at the dual level, work with tensor kernel representations, even towards quantum measurements, we can work with uh, other notions and also for the SVD it is possible to go beyond uh, the, the classical Mercer kernel. And I've also shown that uh, towards networks and big data, it's also possible to exploit the, the knowledge of these primal and these dual uh, representations. So it's also possible from uh, our ERC uh, web page of our uh, research team to download several publications, but also related software. So you're very much invited to try some of these things also by yourself. And uh, finally, I also would like to thank many. Um, so for the interest of the time, so we're going to stop here. So I'm going to uh, make a phone call to uh, Professor Johan Sukens, and this is actually at 5 a.m. in the time of Belgium. So he's so kind to uh, wake up himself, and uh, so I'm going to call him. So in case you have any questions, uh, please uh, start coming forward. So uh, we can uh, talk with uh, Professor Jokens. Hello, is that Professor Johan Jukens? Hello? Hello?
。OK， <笑>直接播是吧？是直接播。这个很好，是吧？四九九，四二，七二，二九，三二，那什么？四九九，四二，七二，五零。Hi, hello. Hello, Professor Sukens. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. It's good that you are with us now. And、uh, so we actually have a、uh, a question from the audience. And、uh, thank you for preparing such a wonderful talk to us. And it's actually very、uh, enlightening, and lots of good materials. Okay.、Uh, so thank you for waking up so early. Okay, here's our first question. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, my name is Li Ding. I really enjoy your talk.、Um, regarding the deep、uh, RKM, I have raised a very fundamental question. That is,、um, I don't see whether that method sort of solve the scalability problem when you want to use dual domain solution. Or am I right? Or am I wrong? So if I understand it correctly, your question is about the、uh, RKM and the dual representation, right? Correct. Correct. You still suffer from dual because you have just have to have still have to form the kernel matrix that is just quadratic with respect to the training size, and that really fundamentally limits your method, just like what you talked about earlier in the standard SVM. Yes, the RKM currently has indeed、uh, the same problems.、Huh? So you have a primal and a dual representation.、Correct. The primal is also in terms of the feature map, and the dual is in terms of the the kernel matrix. So everything what I explained at the beginning of the presentation is also still the case for the RKM. So that is、uh, some future research that has to be done. So one can also. Explore several methods like、uh, online learning, fixed size methods, or decomposition techniques, and and try to apply this to RKM. Okay, good. Also, it's also possible to treat classical neural networks within the setting if you consider the feature map to be the hidden layer. So you can treat the hidden layer interconnection weights at the level of kernel parameters. Okay. In the context of this theory, so there are still many things to be investigated.、Okay. How you best do that? So previously in the presentation we have seen, if you have large data sets, then often it is good to work in the primal, and if you have very high dimensional input spaces, it's better to work in the dual. So the same things probably also apply for the RKM, the restricted kernel machine representation. Okay. So、you also have primal and dual interpretations, but it's a different notion of duality. Okay. Yeah. So great. So the other question that I have related to your answer,、uh, that is, which you didn't talk about at the end of in that part of the, your talk, that is, if you were to use primal domain to solve that deep、uh, K R、uh, R K M,、uh, you know, model learning. You, I don't see how you actually can solve it with the kernel. Yeah, the power of the kernel. Is that correct?、Uh, that is indeed currently unclear because the duality principles are are different. Uh, because uh, normally, you if you have like a regression problem, you have a convex optimization problem. So here, if you look at the、um, The the formulation of the problem,、um, it if you look at the the objective function, it's not a convex function.、Correct. So there is a different way to obtain the different representations. There are 
uh, you look at the stationary points and then from there you can go either to the primal or to the dual representation depending on which variables you are eliminating. Okay, so that is still to be that is still yeah. to be investigated. It's it's just uh, ready now since last week uh, this theory, and you can find the preprint on on my homepage. Okay, on this work, but it's it's the initial work that is now there. But of course, there remains a lot of things to be done. So there are certainly differences with. Uh, uh, classical formulations uh, like in support sector machines and yeah. kernel methods. But the main intention is to make the connection between yeah. kernel machine formulations and the restricted Boltzmann machines as you have them, for example, uh, okay. in the work by, by Hinton and colleagues and also the Boltzmann machines, for example. So there are several connections there. Okay, so but it looks like uh, when you have three objective functions there, when you add up together, each of them is indeed convex, right? So I thought that the whole thing would be because unless one's convex, one is concave, then you actually cancel out. No, that, the, you I, have there the sum of J1, J2, and J3. J1 relates to the objective of, uh, of the LSSVM regression classification part, and the other ones to the kernel PCA. But each of them, they still consist of several terms. Okay. And the overall objective function is not convex. Great. Yeah, so that you would look be... for stationary points in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Please come forward. Thank you. So you have this, uh, you have this animation where you're uh, doing kernelized uh, clustering in a streaming data setting. Uh, so implicitly you're doing uh, online learning. What kind of uh, optimization tools are, are going on um, underneath the hood? Because if you, know, if you wanted to apply uh, stochastic approximation methods to uh, kernel supervised learning, then the size of the kernel matrix uh, keeps growing uh, by one with each new uh, data point that you uh, receive. Yes, so in, in that uh, case, we are working with uh, the kernel spectral clustering as a basic formulation with a fixed size scheme. So it's not that the, the kernel matrix is growing in size, the kernel matrix is fixed in size. And in order to do efficient updating, we are making use of a kind of notion which we call out-of-sample eigenvectors. Because the eigenvector notions correspond, in fact, to the training level, as I explained in the formulations. But we have a model-based approach, a kernel-based approach, that we can also then apply to new data points. And this enables to do the updating in a very efficient way. So typically, in signal processing, you work with rank one updates of matrices, for example, classically. So here, in this context, we have a very simple updating rule, something that we can very efficiently implement. So there is an update at the level of the, the eigenvector solutions, which can be efficiently done and then you can also update the, the prototype factors of the clusters. So these are in fact related to the tips of the lines that we have seen. So in model selection examples, there were some line structures and the tips of these lines they correspond to the prototype factors of the clusters. And also these can be efficiently updated then. I see. So the so these kinds of techniques uh, make make sense for the uh, unsupervised uh, online uh, kernel uh, learning case, but they they wouldn't be uh, necessarily applicable to trying to uh, minimize a, a, like a supervised loss. So, uh, what what kind of techniques do you uh, uh, recommend for that setting? 
Well, in that case, uh, yeah, classical techniques that you can typically apply are based on uh, on rank one updating formulas, uh, like based on the Woodbury formula, for example. But there is also a nice book by uh, Jose Principe and Liu and Simon Hakin, uh, which is specifically about um, uh, online learning with with uh, kernel-based techniques. So they also have developed. Uh, uh, many efficient techniques uh, at this point. So I would also recommend uh, looking into the book by Liu, Heikin, and, uh, and Principe. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So Professor Sulkers, hopefully you can hear our pause. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, being with us, and we really appreciate it. So although uh, we only can watch your video, uh, but we actually learn lots of things from you, and thank you for uh, your big, great effort. And uh, so uh, we hope you and your family are uh, to be safe, and uh, we hope sometime we will be able to meet. Yeah, Hello? thank you so much for the invitation. I apologize that I couldn't be there. Okay, okay. Uh, I wish everybody a peaceful future. So thank you so much for your support. Okay, thank you.